Thank you. So I'm Maurits Kaptein, and indeed, uh, I study decision making of people. Well, actually, what I study is, is how we influence people's decisions. How do we persuade people to do one thing or another? Um, and I want to start off by asking you guys a few questions. Um, I'm sorry about this, but I'm going to pick just one of you. Uh, let's start here in the front. Uh, suppose I would want to get you to donate more to a charity. How would I do it? Any ideas? No clue. You would never donate to charities. That's fine. Uh, but one of the things that actually does work, which people have tried before, so if I take this whole group of you guys, split you up in two. And for half of you, I ask you to write down that you will donate to a charity in the future. Even if you don't want to, you just write it down. and You don't have to commit to anything. And then the next day, I come back and ask for each of you to donate to charity. What I'll find is that in the second half of the group, where people actually committed on paper that they would donate to charity, that I raised more funds. So by getting you to commit to things, I can make it more likely for you to actually do them. Let's take another example. Uh, you over there. Uh, how would I get you, yeah, you. How would I get you to be more active, to work out more, to go training and running? Maybe you do already, but how do I get you to be more active? Well, maybe to be an example to you. Sorry? To be an example to you. Yes, so, so that's one of the things that actually works fairly well. So if I take, again, this group of people, and half of you are asked to work out more. Well, for the other half, I ask you to work out, but I show you different people, other people, that are more active than you are. So I'm going to provide the social proof that there's a lot of other people that are more active than you are. Then in the second case, more people will get active. So using social proof will actually increase your chances of being active. Um, Going to do one, one last example. Um, maybe somebody a bit there on the left. You. So, what if I want to sell you a very shitty book? Like, really, it's a crap book. I want to sell it to you. How would I go about it? Guy in the red sweater. Have an authority book critic tell you it's a good book. So, actually, that's, that's something that works pretty well and it has been tried before. Um, so if I tell you, for example, that it's you know, well-reviewed by the New York Times, I'll actually sell more of those books than when I don't say something like that in the New York Times and their reviews being an authority in this case. Another thing that works fairly well is, for example, to split you guys up in two again and for half of you, tell you that the book is almost sold out. So I'm just going to tell you it's the same crappy book that I'm pitching to you. But for half of you, I'm going to say that it's almost sold out. Now you'll get that more people are actually willing to buy it if I tell you that it's almost sold out. That's a scarcity argument. So we've been talking about commitment, getting you to write things down, social proof, showing that other people are doing something, um, authority, and scarcity. Now these are all strategies to get people to change their decisions or to get people to do things. What I find interesting about these, however, is the fact that they're interchangeable. So if I want you to be more active, well, I can show you that social proof, but I can also ask a physician to ask you to be more active and get you an authority and make sure that I use the same authority argument. Or if I want to get you to donate to charity a bit more, if I tell you that all of your friends have donated to charity, I can use social proof to get you to donate to charity more. So it's not the things we want you to do in the end, it's the way in which we want you to do things or the way in which we ask you to do things. So this is what I study, we call it persuasion, the different means by which you can get people to act. Now, this has been studied, I think, for the last 100 years, and, and even the old Greeks were actually studying how we would influence people. Um, but what is novel about it is that nowadays we are exploring how technology <coughs> might influence people. How we can use, for example, mobile phones or the internet to influence your decision making. And that's interesting, why? Because if I want to get you to donate to charity, I cannot talk at the same time to you to get you to work out more. However, if I mediate my communication through technology, or even have it initiated by technology, I can talk to all of you at the same time. And even more, you're carrying your mobile phone at all times, probably. So I can reach you at any time that I want to reach you. So potentially, technology could be a much more effective influencer than people are. That's what I started studying, and when I first started looking into it, I was really excited to see that in situations where technology is trying to influence you, we're actually using these persuasion strategies. 
If you now go to Amazon.com, which is actively trying to influence you to buy books, you will find that there's authority recommendations. Some of the books are almost sold out. Some of the books are bestsellers, so they use the social proof argument. They use all of these arguments when trying to sell their books. However, we're not too good at it yet. And what I mean by this is very simple. If you now go into a bookstore here in the city center of Tilburg, you start counting how many people go in and how many people walk out with a book, you get around 25%. You do the same for Amazon or a like bookstore. What you'll find is if they get up to 5%, they would be delighted. So there's still a huge gap in how we're able to influence people online and offline. Initially, a lot of people actually thought that this was due to the fact that our communications, our interactions with computers or with technology are intrinsically different from how we respond to people. People respond in different psychological ways differently to people than to computers. That's one of the things that was kind of the hypothesis for why this wasn't working well online. And over the past four years, I've been in the, in the luxury to study together with Clifford Ness at Stanford University how people respond to computers. And a lot of his work goes about showing whether or not people have the same psychological responses to computers as they have towards people. And I want to share one of his experiments with you, because I thought it was intriguing. Um, there's a thing called praise. If you tell me that I'm doing a great job here speaking, then you give me praise. And the effect of praise normally is that I will like you more. I will evaluate you more positively. So if after this talk you come to me and tell me I did a great job, I will probably think you're nicer than the other people here, think you're smarter than the other people here. I'll just evaluate you more positively. Now that's a well-known psychological effect from people to people. What Clifford Ness did was split a group like you guys up into two. And for one half, he had them do a puzzle with a computer. The puzzle, or the computer, would give them some hints on how to solve the puzzle. The other half of the group, the exact same thing. However, now the computer would every now and then state that they were doing a great job, that they were doing a great job solving the puzzle. And then he asked, how valuable was the advice that you got from the computer? And what he found, that in the second case, where the computer gave praise, people thought the advices were more valuable. Um, and he extended the study a bit. Because this thing from people to people does not only work with praise, it actually also works with a thing that's called flattery. What is flattery? It's insincere praise. So if you come to me after this talk and tell me that I did a great job, despite the fact that I know that you weren't here in the room to actually hear it, the thing still works. I will still think that you're friendlier and smarter. So what Cliff Ness did was do the exact same experiment with the computer and the praise, but this time he told people in advance that the computer would every now and then say that they were doing a great job. However, there was a bug that was just random. It had nothing to do with what they were saying. He asked people, do you understand that this is a bug, that this is random? It has nothing to do with what you're doing. People said yes. Afterwards, they evaluated the computer and said the advice was much more valuable than the advice from the computer that didn't give this flattery. And what he concluded was people do not necessarily respond differently to computers psychologically than to people. So I started looking into what, what, what else might it be that we don't understand when we try to persuade people. And one of the core advantages of trying to persuade people using technology is the fact that we can actually follow people around. We can measure how people respond. So what Dean Eccles and I started doing was measuring how people respond to persuasion in a bookstore. So we started measuring, do you buy books that are recommended by authorities? Do you actually buy books that are bestsellers? So do you buy into the social proof argument? And for each and every one of the visitors, we started tracking them over longer periods of time and measuring how they responded to these influence strategies. And what we found was that we could replicate the effect that on average, books that are bestsellers sell more than books that are no bestsellers or books that are almost out of stock, on average, sell more than books that are not scarce. However, at the individual level, things were different. Some of you apparently do not like to buy bestsellers. Some of you never buy those scarcity books, or some of you just don't buy into the New York Times. 
They don't like the authority argument. However, you're all pretty consistent in how you respond to these influence strategies. So over time, what we could do was build up a profile of which of these influence strategies that might be effective on average would actually be effective for each and every customer coming in. We created what we called persuasion profiles, a profile for each individual customer on which of these persuasion strategies actually work and got them to buy the books. Now, we started building these profiles and initially, academically, we published the numbers of papers about it and I obtained my PhD about a year ago on the topic of persuasion profiling. Nowadays, we're using persuasion profiles on large e-commerce sites and we're zooming in or actually closing that gap between the 5% online and the 25% offline. By understanding that these persuasion strategies work, but that there's differences between people, we're closing the gap. And actually, if you reflect back to the sales guy that's in the bookstore, he will not tell each and every one of you the same story. He will adapt his story to how you behave. And that's exactly the same thing that we're doing using persuasion profiles. Now, we're not there yet. There's a few challenges that we still need to face, we still need to tackle. I mean, we've got millions and millions of data points coming in every day. We need to analyze those properly, and we need to be able to estimate those profiles as well as possible. Second, if we have a profile that's probably not complete or it's uncertain in some ways, we need to find the best algorithms to actually select the best persuasion strategy. That's the work that I'm doing right now which is more of statistical nature. However, already, with the limited methods that we have, we're closing the gap between the offline and the online. And I would say, that's actually great news. Why is it great news? Because we can get you, finally, to donate to a charity. And perhaps solve some of the poverty in the world. And maybe we can get you to work out more. And actually, if you work out more, if you're more active, that would help solve a lot of the problems that we have in healthcare nowadays. But you should also be warned, because we will not only get you to donate to charity or to work out more, but we will also get you to buy that shitty book. That's all I want to say.